Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The Hollywood Radio Theater. Every day at this time, Monday through Friday, a J.M. Colas Enterprises production, The Hollywood Radio Theater presents an unusual tale of mystery and suspense. Every week, Monday through Friday, the Hollywood Radio Theater presents... I'm Rod Serling. You're listening to The Zero Hour. Rest your eyes. Open your mind. Exercise your imagination. This week, Bill S. Ballinger studied the deadly obsession. Fourth of Food. Starring John Daner. And Susan Oliver. In Elliot Lewis's production of The Zero Hour. This week, a story of numbers, one man, one woman, and the desperation of their individual single desires. James Marius, freewheeler, habitual gambler, chronic loser. Lou Jackson, mysterious, feline, alluring. Two people among millions who meet in the sprawling metropolitan basin that is Los Angeles, California. A chance meeting, with the odds locked in, to murder. First a proposition, to follow a man and his money for the purpose of separating the two. Second a guarantee, a favorable circumstance and lucrative just rewards. Third, a choice to share the profit or split the loss. Fourth of forever will begin following this word. Picture this, a little used airstrip in a mountainous part of Mexico. Nothing more than a few hundred feet of cleared land. Enough for a skilled pilot to set down a small plane on. A handful of men flank the runway, their eyes to the sky. A small two-engine plane. And one man alone in the cockpit. With one of the two engines missing, my old plane was wavering in the still air. I felt her tremble through the stick in my hands as I circled over the landing strip of that miserable, desolate little field. What really worried me was the cargo. 
The heavy drilling machines lashed in the plane just behind my neck. I cursed myself for taking the contract to deliver the stuff in the first place. Money can force a man to do a lot of things against his will, but lack of money can make him do even more. The machinery was still lashed tight, and I had to get down fast. It was now or never. I went in. The plane was overloaded. The old undercarriage couldn't take it. It went. And then a wing dug, furrowed into the ground. And over she somersaulted with the cargo tearing free, and all hell broke loose. Incendio! 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 Incendio was right. The whole plane was a ball of fire. And inside, I was hanging head down, suspended by my safety belt. Those mechanics were brave men. They got two from the shattered window of the cockpit, clawing through the tangle of wires and insects, choking with the smoke, burning themselves. But they got me out, pulled me through the window, and I got cut bad on the broken glass. But at least I was able to walk away from the plane under my own power, far enough away before the old crate blew. And that was that. The last of my plane. The last of my money. The last of my plans for my own air cargo line. The last of my hopes. Or so I thought. I was despairing. A condition refueled constantly through my hours of fitful sleep. I replayed that horrible event over and over in my dreams for years after. It followed me back to Hollywood. Into the cheap apartments where I lived and right into the bars where I tried to drown the memory, but didn't succeed. Drinking didn't help, regardless of how much I drank or how drunk I got. Like the night I came staggering out of Pernod Place, a joint on Sunset Strip, the car jock gunned my old sports car up to the curb. Evening, Mr. Marius. Uh, you feel okay to drive? I feel great. Yeah. Hey, something new has been added. Since you was a friend of yours, you wanted to wait in your car. I've been waiting a long time. Good evening, James. She smiled at me from where she lounged down and back in the passenger seat. A slow, easy smile showing small white teeth, a casual curving of her lips like a cat's. Her hair was silver gilt and edged with indigo from the neon side outside Pernod Place. I put the car in gear and moved out into the stream of traffic. You're going in the wrong direction. Wrong direction from where? Uh, it's not important. It's the point exactly. Once I get to wherever I'm going, I haven't been any place. I don't know you. I know you. This is a gag. Who put you up to it? My own idea. I'll drive you to the Roosevelt. You can get a cab there. I'm not ready to take a cab. I picked you up. Not for the reason you're probably thinking. Not thinking much of anything right now. Except it's after two. <laughs> I had a date at ten. It was a little late. You don't want to keep it. Uh, if you do, you're going to disappoint me. <laughs> Look what I brought bottle of champagne and one of brandy. I hope you can help me drink it. Hey, look, I live here. I have for quite a while. I'm no sucker for a setup. You don't have enough money to make setting you up, as you put it, worthwhile. I've been to a lot of trouble finding you, Marius. Come on. Let's be pleasant and celebrate my success. Please? Why do you try to find me? Because I think you're the kind of a man I'd like to know. That's not a reason. That's a line. Well, that's the truth. Hey, don't look so suspicious. I am suspicious. A girl who looks like you doesn't usually just appear in a parking lot. It could almost be a compliment. What's your name? Lucille Jackson. My friends call me Lou. Well, now that we've been introduced, where shall we go to have our drinks? My place or yours? Mine. Feel suspicious? Yes. All right, well, go to yours. I swung the car off Sunset Boulevard, La Brea, and cut up Franklin, turned on Highland, and headed north toward the Hollywood Bowl. Just before the bowl, I pulled into the drive of the old Mediterranean Spanish-style apartment building where I lived. 
I parked in the back. She brought the paper bag of bottles. And we entered the patio from a rear archway and walked along the side of a pool to my door at the far end. Inside, I turned on the light. And for the first time, I really saw her. Very tall, slender, with a centuries-old, eternally mysterious smile of feminine knowledge, wisdom, amusement on her lips. She wore black pants and a black silk blouse. A black cat. I'll open the brandy while you uncork the champagne. Here are the glasses. Lou Jackson. Sounds like every name I've ever heard. Should I know it? No reason you should. Let's drink a toast. It's your liquor. What'll it be? To your luck, James Marius. It's going to change. I'll drink to that. What do you know about my luck? It hasn't been good. But at least you've been willing to try. Have I? Mm-hmm. That's one reason I like you. To what do I owe this honor? Why should you pick on me? Well, one night I saw you at a party. What party? It isn't important. You didn't see me. Uh, you were even more drunk than you are now. I asked who you were and uh, found out. And so you couldn't resist me. You're putting me on. I don't believe it. Here I am. Yeah, maybe. Well, I'm going to bed now. If that's an invitation, I accept. When I woke up, the room was bright. It had to be noon or later. I had an awful hangover. It took me a few minutes to remember the night before and Lou Jackson. I saw the empty bottles. They were there, but she was gone. And what else? I groped my way over to my clothes, heaped in a pile on a chair, and went through my trousers. My billfold was missing. I'd been taken, like a naive chump at a convention. It made me sick. Sicker than I was to realize I'd lost my money, driver's license, everything. Everything but credit cards. I didn't own any. Hello. Hello, James. This is Lou. Surprised? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't expect to hear from you again. You missed your billfold? Some time ago. I have it. I guess that. I called to tell you you can have it back. When I took it, I had no intention of keeping it. Well, why'd you take it? Because I wanted to see you again. I thought you'd drive over to my place and pick it up. Last night, you were so cautious, so suspicious, I... Wanted to prove that I could have taken your money if that had been my plan. Now, you see, it wasn't, don't you? I can't drive without my license. You think it's too dangerous? I'll be over. Where do you live? Lou gave me her address in a section of Hollywood near Hollywood Boulevard in the Sunset, just east of what used to be the old Columbia Studios. Her apartment was 2C. Come in, Marius. To my sober eyes in the flat light of the afternoon, Lou was not so young as I remembered. She was in her 30s, 35 maybe, but still beautiful. More beautiful probably than when she'd been younger. Her hair seemed to change from silver to gold and back to silver again to match the transparent gray of her eyes with their great black pupils. I looked around. The apartment was a typical Hollywood furnished deal matching drapes and carpet run-of-the-mill semi-modern furniture. Its only escape from mediocrity was a large oil painting, four feet wide and nearly six feet high, the draped figure of a young woman nude to her waist. Anyone I know? No, I don't know her either. Did it come in the apartment? It belongs to me. Do you like it? Who's it by? A sign D-E-S-T-O. Destel? I think it's... Gazzetti. He doesn't write so well as he paints. Anyway, he isn't well known. Like a drink? Margarita? I love him. Yeah, I need something. Be right back. When I sat down in one of the cushioned chairs, I felt something under my hip. It was an envelope, size and shape of business correspondence, addressed to L. Jackson. 
The return address was Rothman Associates on Western Avenue in Hollywood. I placed the envelope on the coffee table as Lou came back with the margaritas. Here. First for today. Uh, the first? Well, it's still pretty early, but I'll go along. That's my trouble. I always go along. But good. Are you warning me that you're a drunk? Some citizens might say I am. I didn't used to be. You're lovely. And the drinks are good. The apartment is cool and quiet. I should be happy, but I'm not. Why? Because last night you picked me up for a reason. And I can't figure it out. We don't know each other. I know quite a bit about you. Once, you were a good flyer. You crashed, went broke. You tried land speculation, and that folded. What was left, you shot in Vegas. More? Is there? Quite a bit. You owned a piece of the catch Playgirl, which sank the Transpac race to Hawaii, and finally, strictly for money, you tried a few stunt jobs and pictures. You were nearly killed, but this time you collected some insurance, and that's what you've been living on. Huh. Doesn't sound like much of a success story. Now, if you don't mind, I'll have another drink. Oops, sit. Please. Oh. I also know you're 35. Married and divorced once. No, only partly right. I've been married, but not divorced. My wife committed suicide right in the middle of the proceedings. Oh? Did you love her? Oh, here. Thanks. Yes, I loved her. Did she love you? Well, there must have been something she loved more. Now, you've researched me, but you haven't answered my question. Why this interest in me? I'll tell you. Because you're a gambler willing to take a chance. I need a man like that in my life. Uh, no, wait, wait. I'm... I'm. You think you're unlucky. Had all the bad breaks. But the truth is, you are lucky. What's happened to you would have killed the average man a couple of times. Next time, you'll strike it. Really big. I know. Believe me, I know. Oh, the times we had. The ordinary little apartment with drawn drapes holding the soft half-light of a marine grotto. Outside the window, the fronds of a palm rustling in the darkness. Was it that night? Or the next, or the one following that? Time meant nothing. The telescope so that all the wonderful tomorrows were suddenly now. I had told Lou she was lovely, but I was wrong. She was beautiful. It was all so beautiful. Maybe my luck was changing like she said it would. I was falling for her hard. I wanted her. I wanted to know all about her. Tell me, Lou, what are you, what are you doing here? I mean, what do you do? Nothing, just living. My father left me a little money. I get by. You're looking very solemn again. Just thinking. Wish I knew more about you. Ah, uh, is that necessary? <laughs> all women... Any woman will tell you only what she wants you to know. Not deliberately lying, perhaps, but changing things in her memory the, the way she wished they'd happen, or, or might have been. So you see, at best, it's not the truth, but only an impression. An impression of herself as she tells it. <laughs> I, I could tell you that when I was a little girl, there were so many things I wanted and never had. You never married? Nope. I nearly did, once, then I backed out. Who was he? Oh, can't we just drink and be in love and happy to know each other? Does everything have to be put into words, explained and talked away? Let's you and I just be lovers. The days edged into each other, weeks overlapped, but there was always tomorrow. I went back to my own apartment, but Lou and I had built up a lovely routine. She filled my nights as full as, well, sex and liquor can make an addict of any man, and I didn't escape. And yet, I was always assailed by doubt. Doubt that tonight she would fail to arrive. I was frightened that she might drop out of my life as suddenly as she had appeared. She was uh, under no obligation to me, owed me nothing. Always, however, she did come. I'd take her in my arms. 
and our night would begin. Tomorrow was another day. But the day finally came when the last of my money ran out. My checking account was empty. The liquor, my apartment, even my car would have to go. Tomorrow, and finally arrived. I couldn't endure the prospect of life without Lou. I couldn't give her up. She had never discussed marriage, never demanded it, but keep her I must, on any terms. Waiting? I'm always waiting. Uh, you look so glum. Do I? Well, come on in. Maybe a drink will pick me up. Lou, there's something that I have to tell you. Oh? I'm broke. Except for a few bucks in my pocket, I have nothing in the bank or anyplace else. Hmm. What are your, your plans? I don't know. Nothing for me around here. I used to have a good friend in Chicago. Perhaps he can line me up a job back there. Have you written to him? No, not yet. I wanted to tell you first. Now, if, if I go back, will you come with me? We'll get married. No. Darling, I... I love you. You must understand that. I don't... Un then I don't... listen. Listen to me for a moment. I do love you. And I will marry you, but I... I won't do it like this. Beaten down, creeping off to Chicago on our knees to live off a handout from a friend. Well, that's better than living on county charity. For... Is it? Well, what do you suggest? That... That we start... By being honest with ourselves. No, no, no. I, I don't want to sit down. I'll start with myself. No, I, I want nice things. Any woman does. I'd, I'd like a lovely house, nice clothes, a new car, maybe some jewelry. If I'm married, I'd, I'd enjoy being able to travel. And it'd be fun to be able to buy things when I wanted. And if they're children, do things for them, too. Was well, that news? Well, aren't we trying to be honest? You want them, too. That takes money. Lots of it. Money already in the bank. It isn't put there by grubbing, by living in cheap furnished apartments and saving pennies. How is it, then? By taking a chance. One that pays off. One that's big enough to be worthwhile. Move over, darling. <laughs> yeah, sure. Break the bank in Vegas. Hit a gusher. No, no, no. That's <laughs> silly. The odds are too long. I don't mean that way. Well, how do you mean it? Well, it's not clear to me, either. At least... Not right now, but it it must involve a lot of money, and it should take brains, or someone else would have done it. There has to be the element of risk, a calculated risk, but with the odds somewhere in our favor. Let me think about it. Somewhere in the back of my mind, there is an idea. Only a passing thought, really. Oh, sit down, we'll talk no, about no. it. But please, no, it's still early. You don't have to go now. Good night, darling. I'll call you tomorrow when I know more. No more about what? Money, love. Lots of it. At least, all we'd need to be happy together. Please stay. I want you to stay. Afraid I'll leave you because you're broke? No, no, that's not it. Oh, no. risk it, Marius. It's a good gamble. You can't lose. <laughs> Tomorrow at this time, your eyes, and listen here to this week's continuing study in suspense, Fourth of Forever. I'm Rod Serling, and this is The Zero Hour. You've been listening to the Hollywood Radio Theater's presentation of The Zero Hour, heard every weekday at this time. Rod Serling is your host. Force of Forever was written by Bill S. Ballinger. John Daner is Marius. And Susan Oliver is Lou. Featured in the cast is Don Diamond. Zero Hour is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Jack Myers is executive producer. Rochelle Sherman, associate producer. And Kim Weisskopf, story editor. Music conducted and composed by Stanley D. Hoffman. The Hollywood Radio Theater theme was played by Ferranti and Teicher and is now available on United Artists Records and Tapes. This has been a J.M. Colas Enterprises production. Hugh Douglas speaking. 
Tune in tomorrow and once again, rest your eyes and listen here to The Zero Hour. The Chilling True Terror of the Black-Eyed Kids, a monster compilation by G. Michael Vasey. The Black-Eyed Kids are an urban legend of vast proportions. The stories of small children turning up on people's doorsteps all across the world, spreading fear and terror, have only increased over time. This compilation of G. Michael Vasey's books on this scary phenomena include new material and new true stories, as well as the complete texts of The Black-Eyed Demons Are Coming and The Black-Eyed Kids. Supernatural expert G. Michael Vasey carefully investigates this truly terrifying phenomenon using real-life encounters with these scary supernatural beings. The result is an unsettling and sometimes terrifying book that'll have you fearfully anticipating that knock at your door, late at night. Who and what are these mysterious visitors to the doorstep? Are they demons? Aliens? What do they want? Why do they need to enter your home? And what happens if they do? Small kids that ask to use your phone or for a ride, and yet those who encounter them are scared to death even before they notice their black eyes. The Chilling True Terror of the Black-Eyed Kids, a monster compilation by G. Michael Vasey. Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. The Hollywood Radio Theater. Every day at this time, Monday through Friday, a J.M. Colas Enterprises production, The Hollywood Radio Theater presents an unusual tale of mystery and suspense. Every week, Monday through Friday, the Hollywood Radio Theater presents... I'm Rod Serling. You're listening to The Zero Hour. Rest your eyes. Open your mind. Exercise your imagination. This week, Bill S. Ballinger's study of a deadly obsession. Fourth of Forever. Starring John Daner. And Susan Oliver. In Elliot Lewis's production of The Zero Hour. James Marius, one man alone, with a passion for gambling, a dependence upon alcohol, and a desire for one woman. Lou Jackson, one woman. A woman who knows what she wants and what's necessary to do to get it. They met in a parking lot on the Sunset Strip. The right place, the right time. For James Marius, the desire has become an obsession. But the obsession has left him penniless and vulnerable. For Lou Jackson, this is a man primed for action, not afraid to take a risk. A risk she is now prepared to ask him to take. The stakes must be high and the odds long. 
The reward James Marius will seek is nothing short of forever. Fourth of Forever continues in a moment. I slept very little that night. My nightmare replayed in living color. All the next morning I was tense, anxious, filled with an almost evil foreboding. And yet, I couldn't help thinking about the fortune Lou had half promised. She phoned me in the afternoon. Her voice was warm and easy as always. She suggested we meet for a drink at Perno Place. In a way, it was sort of ironic. We had first met there when I was in the depths, and now it seemed our second meeting might rocket me to new heights. Waiting long? Just got here. Sit down, darling. I missed you. All night. You wondered why I left? Understatement. Waiter. Two scotches on the rocks. Remember what we were discussing? Well, I used to know a girl named... Clara, no uh, glamour puss, no sharp cookie. Actually, she's pretty dull. Yeah. I first met her when I, I came out here. Clara's a secretary, private secretary to a rich real estate man, Theodore Warren, Ted Warren. Ever heard of him? Maybe the name's familiar. Well, it's... Clara has no life of her own, no men, not much of anything, so she's built her whole life around her boss, all she can talk about. She takes care, but really, of all the details for him. Whenever we met for lunch, she told me every little thing, and frankly, it, it was a bore. I couldn't have cared less. Why did you keep on seeing her, then? Oh, I felt sorry for her, I suppose. Anyhow, her boss, Ted Warren, has lots of irons in the fire. He goes to New York every month or two and takes huge amounts of cash with him. Well, part in cash, part in negotiable stocks and bonds. Don't you think that's rather odd? Well, it takes a week to ten days for a check to clear between Los Angeles and New York. Maybe he uses the money for down payments, guarantees, possibly performance bonds. That might be it. Anyway, Mr. Warren, I gather, is a bit of an old toad, always stays at the same hotel, same suite. <laughs> he likes a particular view of the park. You're building up to something. What? Why don't you get that money the next time Warren goes to New York? There it was, all laid out on the table. I wasn't outraged, merely shocked. In my own desperation, I'd considered a lot of ways to raise money, but robbery wasn't one. I couldn't believe it as I stared across the table at Lou, her soft face, her aura of gentleness. I can get all the details from Clara. She won't even know I'm asking. She'd never suspect me. What about Warren? Oh, what about him? He doesn't know you from Adam. Devil, yeah, couldn't he make the connection between Clara and you? Maybe, but by that time, we'll be so far away from here, they'll never find us. If I go to New York, it'll take money just to get there. Oh, I thought of that. Here is a cashier's check. A thousand dollars. It's nearly the last of what I have. We're in this together, darling. Let's drink to it. That next week, Lou renewed her friendship with Clara... They met for lunch nearly every day at exactly 12 noon. Lou had come to my apartment in the evening with a bottle and the latest information. On Thursday, when I heard her footsteps coming through the patio, I knew that Lou had news to relay that would finally be useful. Oh, love, good news. Warren's going to New York on the 23rd. Oh, that doesn't leave us much time. There's more. Let's go inside. I'll get the scotch. No, no, wait. We'll need clear heads for this. Uh, he's got a reservation on Transcontinental Airlines Flight 171 for the 23rd. That's Wednesday. Mm -hmm. He arrives at 9.36 New York time. Kennedy Airport? No, Newark. And he'll take a taxi from there to the Park Hamilton in Manhattan. Well, what about the money? He stays right in his room in a briefcase. And that's where you'll relieve him of it. What about a gun? Doesn't own one. Clara says he hates loud noises. <laughs> Warren must be a real ringer. No gun. Still, I'll need one. Do you have a gun? I can get one. How? I'll tell you later. Would you like that drink now? Ah, 
I'd love one. Soon, Marius, very soon, we'll be toasting in champagne. I'll drink to that. The following morning, I went out to a studio where a director friend of mine was shooting a picture. On the soundstage, I managed to lift a revolver from the props. Smith & Wesson 38. It was easy. Next, I needed bullets. I bought them in the black market on Sunset. Then I got Warren's business address from the Yellow Pages. Dressed in a pair of coveralls like maintenance servicemen wear, and with an assortment of plastic alphabet letters, I took up a position in the corridor outside the doors of Warren's office. I pretended to make adjustments on the building's bulletin board while I waited for Warren to leave for lunch, promptly at 12. Lou had told me that he usually carried an expensive alligator briefcase. I glanced at my watch. One minute of... It was a man with a briefcase, but I wasn't positive the man was Warren. The time was right, and he carried a briefcase, but he was younger than I thought he'd be. I went through the heavy walnut panel doors, which were lettered in gold. Theodore K. Warren, Realty. A young, pretty receptionist was seated behind a desk. Yes? I say, uh, is Mr. Warren in? Who shall I say is calling? From the, uh, the, the garage. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Warren just left for lunch. Oh. Well, was that him getting on the elevator when I got off wearing a dark suit, carrying a briefcase? Mm, must have been. He hasn't been gone two minutes. Here you are, darling. You worried about something. I got a look at Ted Warren. Have you ever seen him? No, all I know about him is what Clara's told me. What Clara's told you isn't quite true. Warren's not the little toad he is supposed to be. But that's not what worries me. What is it, then? If Clara gives you a wrong description about how Warren looks, why can't she be wrong about a lot of other things we're depending on? Oh, I wouldn't worry. Clara may have described Warren as a doddering, puttering little old man who depends on her just to make herself feel more important. But fact, business facts, oh, she couldn't make a mistake about them. I hope not. Uh, <laughs> stop worrying, darling. Just, just think about us. I guarantee it'll work. The afternoon of Tuesday the 22nd, Lou came to my apartment. I left my car parked there. She drove me to the airport. On the way, we went over the plan. Warren will check into the Park Hamilton Suite 1220 around 1045. At 11, he should be getting ready for bed. And that's when I hit him. I'll get the money and be out of the hotel by 10 after 11. I'll have a cab waiting to take me to LaGuardia Airport in time to catch the 12.30 flight to L.A. Mm -hmm. right? now, if something goes wrong and you don't catch it... Well, I'll wait for the next flight. Where will you stay tonight? I'll find a hotel near the Park Hamilton. And tomorrow, during the day, I'll get a look at Warren's suite, locate the doors, windows, exits, elevators, and so on. Tomorrow night, when he arrives, I'll be ready. On the flight to New York, I still had doubts. I realized I was taking a calculated risk and was banking on my strength and nerves to mesh correctly with time, place, and circumstances to gain a fortune. But I wasn't sure I still had the guts to pull it off. I wasn't a coward, I never have been, but now I was trying to be honest. The cold fact was, I didn't want to rob Warren. It was Lou who had put me on the plane, winging closer each minute to New York. It was this very weakness in submitting to Lou that made me doubt myself. My memory of those desolate years of loneliness and despair before I met Lou was my greatest enemy. I couldn't fight the future she'd brought me, a green oasis of hope. We will be landing in New York City in approximately 20 minutes. We hope you've enjoyed your flight. The struggle for survival is as strong now as it was a million years ago. The strong grow stronger, and the weak are lost. I decided that Warren could look out for his own money, and I was going to take it from him. I registered in a small hotel, the Shropshire, under the name of Howard Morgan. It was only a couple of blocks from the Park Hamilton. The next morning, I slept late, had breakfast, then strolled over to familiarize myself with the layout of Warren's hotel. 
It had three entrances, one on 59th Street and two around the corner on 5th Avenue. The streets were narrow and congested and could easily be traffic traps, so I decided against the taxi for my escape. Instead, I'd walk over to 59th and Madison to catch a cab to the airport. The lobby of the Park Hamilton was big, ornate, with acres of green carpeting and vast walls of antique mirrored glass. It was possible to enter the hotel and go to the elevators without passing the registration desk, so I took one to the 10th floor. Most hotel rooms are numbered identically as the floors ascend. In other words, suite 1020 would probably be the same layout as 1220, where Warren would stay. 1020 had a main door opening on the broad corridor running parallel to Fifth Avenue. There was a secondary entrance and a small corridor around the corner. I decided this second door led to either a service pantry or a back bedroom. Next to it was a stairway encased in a firewell. I climbed it, two floors, and found myself standing outside the service door of suite 1220. The layout of the two suites was identical. So I returned by the stairs again to the 10th floor where I caught the elevator to the lobby. Then I left the hotel. I went to a drugstore and bought copper wire, adhesive tape, and a pair of women's nylons. I'd used one of them for a face mask. I passed the rest of that interminable day waiting for the inevitable night, thinking about Lou, about our future together, with enough money to live in style. I worked out in my mind how it would be when I confronted Warren. He would answer the door. I'd hold him at the point of my revolver, bind his hands with wire, and tape his mouth shut. Then lock him in a closet. It'd take him at least ten minutes to get free. If he put up a fight, I'd smack him with a gun, knock him unconscious. At eleven o'clock, I left the bar in the Shropshire. I wasn't drunk. I returned to my room, got my gun, and the rest of what I'd need. Then I started for the park Hamilton and Ted Warren. I stopped behind the metal door of the firewell on the 12th floor. There I took off my top coat, folded it, and placed it on the floor just inside the door. The wire and tape were in my pockets. Pulling a nylon over my face, I checked my gun and stepped out into the hall. For a moment, I stared at the door, 1220. This was the point of no return. Who's there? Uh, Mr. Warren? Uh, Sam, I'm sorry to disturb you. Uh, I'm from maintenance. What the hell's that? There, there's a short on this floor. Uh, I gotta check the lights. Oh, hurry it up. I'm getting ready for bed. As soon as I saw the door crack open, I slammed it back on him with all my might. It knocked him halfway across the room. He was wearing an open dressing gown and pajama pants. Behind him, a hall led to a darkened bedroom. A mirror in the hall reflected the open door. Though I had the revolver pointed at his chest, he appeared more angry than frightened. What do you want? The money, Mr. Warren. My wallet? You're welcome to. You know what I mean. Where's the briefcase? You won't shoot. You'd never make it out of the hotel. Just shut up and give me the damn briefcase. It's over in the bureau. Get it? All right. And keep your hands where I can see them. Warren went to the bureau, took out the briefcase, and came back, holding it in front of him. Then, ah, he shot me from behind his briefcase. I fell back, and my right arm jerked up with pain. I saw the reflection of the flame from my revolver in the mirror before the bedroom. Warren pitched forward to the floor. I didn't stop with the brief briefcase or anything. I just turned and ran. In the firewell by the stairs, I realized I had dropped my revolver in the suite, but I couldn't go back. Warren was wounded, but he still had his gun. He was probably on the phone calling for help at that very moment. Blood was dripping from my arm, running down my wrist and spattering the concrete stairs. I grabbed my top coat and started down, leaving a red trail behind me. At the mezzanine floor, just above the lobby, I stopped again. I yanked off the nylon mask and struggled out of my jacket. Rolling up the sleeve of my shirt, I looked at the wound. The bullet was lodged in the muscle of my right arm, a few inches above the elbow. I knew it had to come out, and soon. I wrapped a piece of the soft copper wire around my arm above the wound, twisting it into a tourniquet to stem the flow of blood. Then I bit into the tape, tore off a strip, and plastered it over the nylon to make a bandage. By now, my arm was stiff and throbbing. I had a tough time getting back into my jacket. 
I swung the top coat over my shoulders, leaving it to hang free, and covered my wounded arm, which I stuffed in my jacket pocket for support. Then I descended the firewell to the lobby. I opened the metal door of the firewell and peered out. I could see across the lobby. Everything seemed normal. But just then, two men, unmistakably detectives, accompanied by a cop in uniform, came in the Fifth Avenue entrance and walked briskly to the registration desk. Whatever they said caused the desk clerk to start in surprise, and he hurriedly called the night manager. Then it went into a huddle, then the manager and the two plainclothesmen headed for the elevators. The uniformed cop stayed at the desk and looked over the lobby. I didn't wait. Forcing myself to stroll casually, I made it to the 59th Street entrance. Ignoring the doorman's offer to get me a cab, I headed down 59th Street toward Madison Avenue. At the corner of Madison, I flagged down a taxi and got in. The ambulance heading for the Park Hamilton. Some guy must have had a stroke. You know, they do it all the time. They drop like flies. You know why? Everybody's always in a hurry already. Uh, where to, Mac? What time is it? Uh, 11.30. Uh, that's too late to catch my flight. So? All right, what next? Penn Station. On our way. I didn't go to the station. I knew there'd be an APB out for a wounded man at all railroad stations, airports, bus depots, even ship terminals. I got out at 37th Street. Down the block, I saw a cut-rate drugstore and headed for it, self-service. I picked up a cheap canvas suitcase, a bottle of iodine, roll of cotton, a box of cleaning tissue, a razor, and cheesy orange sports shirt, the only one in the store that would fit me. A cashier with hair handed about the color of my new shirt checked me out with a comment about my hand. The whole right side of my body was stiffening up. I told her I had arthritis in my shoulder. And she told me her husband had arthritis, and uh, that was that. I walked aimlessly down the street, my mind... Fuzzy with shock and fatigue. But I had to find a place to stay the night. I had to get off the streets before I was picked up. A liquor store was closing for the night, but I had caught it in time to buy a bottle of whiskey. A hundred proof. By now, my arm was pulsating in a deadly, heavy rhythm. My sense of balance dipped and whirled. I fought to remain conscious. In desperation, I hailed another cab. You drunk? Uh, no. No. Sick. Won't drive it drunk, but if you're just sick, buddy, I'll take you. Hospital? Not the hospital. Stranger in town. Just, just got in. Take me to his hotel. I just want to go to bed. Which hotel? Anyone. Just so it isn't midtown. Some down near the village. Okay. The Archway Hotel is located on East 9th Street. It's small and secluded, with miserable little potted trees on each side of the entrance. The desk clerk watched me full of doubts and suspicion. I registered awkwardly with my left hand, signing under the name of Seaton. I explained to him that I'd smashed my right hand on the train. He looked relieved and showed me my room. As soon as he was gone, I threw myself on the bed and opened the suitcase. The world was spinning like a gyroscope. I pulled out the bottle, worked the cap free with my teeth, and I took a pull. The whiskey ran down my chin and dripped to my chest. My worst fears had been realized. Clara's information, like her description, had been wrong. I fell asleep holding the bottle in my belly, thinking about Lou and the future we'd lost. Tomorrow at this time... Rest your eyes and listen here to this week's continuing study in suspense, Fourth of Forever. I'm Rod Serling, and this is The Zero Hour. You've been listening to the Hollywood Radio Theater's presentation of The Zero Hour, heard every weekday at this time. Rod Serling is your host. Fourth of Forever was written by Bill S. Ballinger. John Daner is Marius, and Susan Oliver is Lou. Featured in the cast are Marvin Miller, Ann Whitfield, and Peter Leeds. 
Zero Hour is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Jack Myers is executive producer. Rochelle Sherman, associate producer. And Kim Weisskopf, story editor. Music conducted and composed by Stanley D. Hoffman. The Hollywood Radio Theater theme was played by Ferranti and Teicher and is now available on United Artists Records and Tapes. This has been a J.M. Colas Enterprises production. Hugh Douglas speaking. Tune in tomorrow and once again, rest your eyes and listen here to The Zero Hour. When I was a little kid, I used to get a magazine every month that had a page of hidden objects, people, or animals to find. Later in life, I had fun with those books where you had to look for the guy wearing glasses and red and white striped clothing amongst a sea of other people. Many mobile games now are centered on finding hidden objects to get to the next level. We humans love searching for lost items and finding them. Maybe that's why we're so fascinated by cryptids like Bigfoot, always hiding, waiting to be found. That's what the book Your Bigfoot Expedition is all about, the perfect gift for the cryptid connoisseur. Be that a friend, family member, or yourself. Dozens of pages of gorgeous original paintings by artist Timothy Wayne Williams, with a Sasquatch hiding in each and every one of them. Some are more easy to find than others. Some are hidden so well you would swear there wasn't one, but there is. Your Bigfoot Expedition allows you to travel across the country through all four seasons of the year, from the comfort of your own home. Find the creature in each scene, then challenge others to do the same. The perfect coffee table book for when you have people visiting. Find the book Your Bigfoot Expedition by Timothy Wayne Williams on Amazon, or click on the store page at WeirdDarkness.com. The Hollywood Radio Theater. Every day at this time, Monday through Friday, a J.M. Colas Enterprises production, The Hollywood Radio Theater presents an unusual tale of mystery and suspense. Every week, Monday through Friday, the Hollywood Radio Theater presents... I'm Rod Serling. You're listening to The Zero Hour. Rest your eyes. Open your mind. Exercise your imagination. This week, Bill S. Ballinger's study of a deadly obsession. Fourth of Forever. Starring John Daner. And Susan Oliver. In Elliot Lewis's production of The Zero Hour. It has been said that luck is a lady, either good or bad, but never in between. James Marius has spent a lifetime leaning on Lady Luck. He's been a gambler of magnitude, never one to bother with a penny ante game. Then he met Lou Jackson, his biggest venture to date. It was all or nothing. And a man on a losing streak is liable to shoot the works on a long shot. Such was the case with James Marius. A 3,000 mile coast to coast flight a time and place, and the word of a woman he'd never seen. Lady Luck followed him that night to a New York hotel. He had lots of luck, all of it bad. 
And for his trouble, James Marius incurred a debt the law requires he pay for with the rest of his life. Fourth of Forever resumes after this word. I awoke with a start from the old familiar nightmare. But this time, Lou was with me in the battered DC-3. We were trying to find a place to land, but couldn't. Gas was running out. And so was time. Time. That's what woke me up. I looked at my watch. It was four in the morning. I would make it one in Los Angeles. Dangerous as it was, I had to phone Lou from the hotel. Warn her that Warren was shot. I placed the call. Why didn't she answer? She should have been there, but she wasn't. What had happened? Had the police already taken her? My fear was more terrible than any I'd ever known. Not for me, but for Lou. How could the cops have connected her with me so quickly? They hadn't taken me yet. What was happening? I couldn't go back to sleep. The blazing in my arm kept me up. I knew I had to have it taken care of, the bullet removed. I needed a drink, but instead I emptied the bottle down the drain. I could no longer afford the luxury of getting drunk. I was facing a 20-year jolt for attempted robbery and the accidental shooting of Warren. I destroyed my return plane ticket. All out-of-town flights would be screened thoroughly. Of Lou's thousand dollars, I had about 500 left, enough to get me back some way. I waited until about eight before leaving the hotel. I draped my top coat over my right arm to conceal the blood stains on the sleeve. Walking to University Place, I bought a paper and went into a small cafe. It was practically empty. I sat in a booth near the back and ordered coffee and opened the paper. The story was on page three. It wasn't a big one, but the headline caught my eye and shook me through to my feet. Multi-millionaire murdered in hotel room. The article said Warren's body was discovered after an anonymous phone call to the police. Bloodstained prints had been found on his door. The lab was checking these for identification. My belly dropped. Warren was dead. I hadn't meant to shoot him. I hadn't aimed. I didn't remember pulling the trigger. All I remembered was his shot and my arm jerked. And then the second shot and the reflection in the hall mirror. In the back of the restaurant was a public phone booth. I tried to call Lou again. know who this is. Is it all right to talk? I couldn't understand it. Why would she take so long to answer and then not say a word? Was it possible the cops were in her apartment and trying to trace the call already? I left the cafe in a hurry. I took a cab to the Bowery. My jacket was badly bloodstained, so I bought another one in a used clothes store for five dollars, and then I walked up the street. I knew I had to get out of New York, but I had to do something about my arm first, get that bullet out before the infection took over. I stopped in front of a fly speck window and tried to light a cigarette. Give you a beauty, mister. Huh? Oh. Oh. Bojo Jack's tattoo parlor. Take your pick. Anything you want. Butterflies, mermaids, hearts and doves, battleships, the works, man. Twenty-five bucks. Bojo Jack had an old leathery face split into a wide smile. One front tooth was missing. The other was rotten with a gold star right in the center. His features were squashed together as if he supported a heavy weight on his head. But his hands were what caught my attention. They were sensitive and delicate. I'll make you a deal. Cut it to 15. Let's talk inside. The tattoo shop was long and narrow and partitioned by a heavy green curtain. I assume Jack lived behind it. In front was a white kitchen table, a couple of metal stools, and on a shelf by the table were his instruments and inks. Hanging above the table from a cord was a large light bulb inside a metal reflector. 
I've been messing around this business 40 years, mister. You ain't gonna get hurt none. Don't hurt at all. How would you like to make $50? Tattooing? No. Mm-hmm. I thought not. I'll do a lot of things for 50 bucks, but, but not everything. What you got in mind? If you turn down my proposition, will you keep quiet about it? Well, I don't ever do much talking unless someone's whipping me real good. That happens, uh, maybe I'll talk. Won't happen. I got a slug in my arm. Can you take it out? The man after you? No, not yet. You have plenty of time. Ain't got much of anything to work with. It figures to hurt real bad. It hurts now. Wait, let me take a look. Don't want nobody watching me. Now we need a little light. That's better. That arm, well, it ain't so awful bad. Don't look like any bone broken. I guess if you can stand it, I can. I'll have to. Get out of that shirt and wrap this sheet around you while I get some hot water and things. <laughs> Got to use a lot of hot water. Real clean, like a doctor. Jack came back with the water, a straight-edged razor, a pair of tweezers, and a metal ice pick, and a bottle of gin. He started to wrap a cord tightly around my arm. You hold this ice on that proud flesh. Sort of deaden it down a little bit. Now, I can do it two ways. Sort of slow-like, which will hurt a long time, or right quick. Get it over with. That's where I like it myself. Got into a bit of shooting a couple of times, too. Hate to waste this good gin washing my hands. Just like old Dr. Kildare. Nothing better than gin to keep the bugs out, though. Well, here she goes. I clung to the metal stool and bent a rung on it. Then it was over. Jack poured gin in the wound and bandaged it up, neat, professional, and handed me the slug for a souvenir. Now I could concentrate on getting home. I had to see Lou, regardless of the danger. Somehow I had to get back to L.A. I'd find her and we'd leave together. Beyond that, I had no plans. I took a bus from New York to Boston. I tried to call her from the depot. Sorry, you have reached a disconnected number. Please check your number and dial again or ask your operator for assistance. This is a recording. From Boston, I took a train to Chicago and took a taxi to the airport. It was risky, but I flew from Chicago to San Francisco. I made it without a hitch. And from San Francisco to Los Angeles by bus. In the L.A. bus station, I bought a newspaper... It said that the police in both New York and Los Angeles were searching for James Marius in connection with Warren's murder. Obviously, I'd been identified through my prints. But to my great relief, there was no mention of Lou Jackson. She hadn't been connected. Lou was safe. I would have to be careful about contacting her again, but that was a risk I was compelled to take. I decided to try Lou's apartment. No one there had seen me before, so I wouldn't be recognized. Unless the cops were waiting for me there. I found her name had been removed from the mailbox, so I tried the manager. Yes? Say, I'm looking for a friend of mine who used to live here, Miss Lucille Jackson. She moved last Thursday. Thursday? The 24th? Well, I don't know what day. Yeah, yeah, the 24th. Hey, look, I, I got a show I'm watching here. I got no Has time. Has Miss Jackson apartment been rented yet? You ask a lot of questions. Well, I'm looking for a place to rent. Is it vacant? Oh, won't you say so? Come on, I'll show it to you. It's in perfect condition. You'll love it. Your friend was real clean. I didn't even have to paint. Go ahead. Take a look around. Yeah. 
Lou, uh, Miss Jackson used to have a painting of mine. A big one, a nude woman. I don't know nothing about no nude painting. I leave my tenants be. How long did she live here? Oh, four, five months, maybe. And did she leave a forwarding address? No. Hey, do you want the place or don't you? Well, I'll get back to you. Thanks. Common sense warned me not to go to my old apartment. The cops would have my place staked out. It was an awful risk. But I knew I'd try because of the faint possibility she might have left me some clue. So at 3.30 in the morning, the darkest hour of the night, I crept into the parking lot behind the apartment building. As I expected, my car was gone, impounded by the police. I didn't see anyone around the patio or pool. My apartment was dark. I listened outside a window. Nothing. Finally... I went inside. Suddenly, I froze. Against the faint light of the window, I saw the silhouette of head and shoulders rising from the couch. A cop. Who's there? Oh, I'll shoot! It's no use, Marius! We know who you are! I ran up a hill behind the Hollywood Bowl. A short, winding street. I saw a parked car in an open garage. It was concealed in the shadows. I climbed in. I stretched out in the back seat, cursing myself. Now the cops knew I was back in Los Angeles. I just had one lead left. Clara in Warren's office. Theodore Warren, Realty. I'd like to speak to Clara... Uh, Mr. Warren's secretary? Uh, uh, well, Mr. Warren passed away, you know. So I heard. But may I speak to Clara, please? Uh, Clara who? How could that be? Clara must have lied about everything. Even about being Warren's secretary. Then I remembered the painting. Lou had taken it with her when she moved so quickly. If she needed money as badly as I, she might try to sell it. Now, who was the painter? Well, what was his name? Gazzetti. I looked up an art dealer, went to his gallery, and he said... Gazzetti? No, we don't have anything he's done. Well, I saw a seated, draped figure of a nude he did. I'd like to buy it. Um, if it were for sale, what would it cost? Some Gazzetti's brought 5000 a few years back. Might be higher now. That much? Why? <laughs> You're paying for snob appeal. Apparently, Lou hadn't tried to sell the painting. But it puzzled me. How had she gotten hold of a $5,000 painting? I was of the belief that she had only a limited income. Getting around on foot had become too hazardous. I had to have a car. I walked to a big supermarket... Hundreds of parked cars, big, small, cheap, expensive, take your pick. I wasn't choosy. I found a small, inconspicuous sedan with its keys tucked in the sun visor above the wheel. I got in and drove off. I returned to my boarding house and switched plates with another car parked on the street. I had transportation now, but not much else. I went up to my room and had a drink. And once again in my memory, I saw Lou... Her silver gilt hair aglow in the sparkle of my imagination. The music of her voice, the touch of her fingers, the scent of her body were opiates that deadened the pain of my failure, the loneliness. I sat down in the soft chair and thought back to how it was. I could see in my mind the gazetti on the wall, and there had been an envelope. When I sat down, there was a name on that envelope... Oh, hell, what was it? Rothman. Rothman Associates had an office in a shabby building on Western Avenue. Just the name on the door, nothing else. Rothman himself was a wiry man with blunt features and thinning hair parted in the center. He stared at me through deep-set eyes. Didn't offer to shake hands. Sit down. Say, I'd like to get in touch with Miss Lou Jackson. I think you know her. I think you're wrong. Yeah, well, I've been away, Mr. Rothman. In the meantime, she's moved. Uh, no forwarding address. Could be she didn't want you to find her. 
Now, that isn't the reason. We're good friends. What's your name? Horton. Clarence Horton. <laughs> you're lying. No. No, you're lying, Mr. Rothman. She gave me your name. We don't give out information regarding clients. You're a private investigator. Now, that's good thinking. Well, I'm not asking for information, Mr. Rothman, just an address. Don't have it. Haven't heard from him in maybe, well, about six months. Well, did you have her address before then? Mr. My business is selling information, not giving it away. Fifty dollars a day. You want us to find him? All right, here's fifty for one day's work. Just give me your old address. See what I can do. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah, here's your folder. I, uh... I see the Jackson woman paid us in cash. She didn't give an address. Well, she must have had some way for you to get in touch with her. Yeah. Oh, here's a telephone number we were checking out. Who did you say you were? Rothman shoved back his chair. I don't know what alarmed him, but he came at me. I picked up a metal ashtray off the desk. Then slowly. Oh. He fell across the desktop. <laughs> I grabbed at the white card he had in his hand. And the card tore in two. I still had part of it as I ran from the office. I reached the street and slowed to a fast walk so as not to attract attention. Around the corner where I'd parked the stolen car, I paused to look at the piece of card. There was a name. Lucille Jackson. A telephone number in the San Fernando Valley and the notation paid $500. I tore up the card, chewed the pieces to pulp and spit them out. And I got in the car. Call it. Here. Yes, officer? Outside. Up against the car. Let's go. Uh, yeah. Oh, what's this all about? Where'd you get this car? Picked up. And identified because of that lousy stolen car. One of the new plates had fallen off while I was driving. All they had to do was find the mate. And they did. They threw me in a cell with a little guy, about 40, with a wise, secretive, perpetual smile. He told me his name was Leroy Grimes. I figured he might be a plant, a stoolie, so I didn't say much. Uh, the f f first, uh, first time? My third. <clears throat> What's the rap? Did they question you yet? Uh, you don't talk much, do you? No, not much. I wasn't interrogated right away. Instead, I was taken from my cell and led to another room. It was small, completely bare, no furnishings of any kind, no fixtures, but a light sunk into the ceiling. I sat on the floor, my back propped against a wall, and waited. And waited. I don't know how long, but it seemed forever. My watch had been taken away, as well as my necktie, my belt, even my shoelaces. I stretched out on the concrete floor and tried to sleep, but I couldn't. Instead, I lapsed into a state of melancholy, thinking of Lou. She was to be my deliverance, my savior, my wife. Wherever she was, I wanted to tell her I was sorry. I wanted to tell her that I loved her. The fact that I would more than likely spend the rest of my life in prison weighed heavily on my mind. But it was the stark realization I might never see Lou again that drew my emotions up into my throat, choking off all I held dear. I wept. All was lost. Tomorrow at this time, rest your eyes and listen here. To this week's continuing study in suspense, Fourth of Forever. I'm Rod Serling, and this is The Zero Hour. You've been listening to the Hollywood Radio Theater's presentation of The Zero Hour, heard every weekday at this time. Rod Serling is your host. Fourth of Forever was written by Bill S. Bellinger. John Daner is Marius, and Susan Oliver is Lou. Featured in the cast are Jester Hairston, Jerry Hausner, Donald Lawton, Anne Whitfield, 
Peter Leeds, and Jay Novello. Zero Hour is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Jack Myers is executive producer. Rochelle Sherman, associate producer. And Kim Weisskopf, story editor. Music conducted and composed by Stanley D. Hoffman. The Hollywood Radio Theater theme was played by Ferranti and Teicher and is now available on United Artists Records and Tapes. This has been a J.M. Colas Enterprises production. Hugh Douglas speaking. Tune in tomorrow and once again... Rest your eyes and listen here to The Zero Hour. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. The Hollywood Radio Theater. Every day at this time, Monday through Friday, a J.M. Colas Enterprises production, The Hollywood Radio Theater presents an unusual tale of mystery and suspense. Every week, Monday through Friday, the Hollywood Radio Theater presents... I'm Rod Serling. You're listening to The Zero Hour. Rest your eyes. Open your mind. Exercise your imagination. This week, Bill S. Ballinger's study of a deadly obsession. Fourth of Forever. Starring John Daner. And Susan Oliver. In Elliot Lewis's production of The Zero Hour. James Marius, a man on the run, running both to and from, from the law that says he must answer for a dead man, to find Lou Jackson, a mystery woman, to be sure, one whose trail leads to only dead ends, an empty apartment, a telltale painting, a telephone number, and the dying hope for tomorrow. James Marius, a man whose tomorrows are in danger of becoming condensed into one long stretch of time. He's a man driven by a relentless obsession to protect and recover a lost dream. A dream capable of lifting him up and away from all that is real. A murdered man, prison for life, and eternal solitude. For James Marius, the running has only just begun. First to win, second to place, third to show. Fourth of Forever will continue after this word. I don't know how long I was out. I had no way of measuring time. I just remember waking suddenly and feeling the cold concrete under my back. I opened my eyes and saw only a bright naked light blazing down at me from the ceiling. 
that I sensed a presence in the room. Suddenly, a face dipped into my line of sight. I couldn't make out the features, only teeth. Sleep well, Marius? What does a killer dream about? Easy, Harry. We could be here a while. Not if he's smart and talks fast. Then we can all go home except Marius here. He's not going anywhere. Not for a long, long time. Lay t- off him, Harry. Come on, sit down. You too, Marius. Grab a seat. Now, maybe we can get down to business. We'd just like a few answers. You don't have to answer my questions. You got a right to an attorney. You understand? Yes. The New York cops have a few questions for you, Jimmy boy. You can give us a few answers and rack up a few points for yourself or take what's coming to you. Why not let the New York cops ask me? Of course I'm asking. Cool off, Harry. We got a worse guy here, Ed. Very funny fellow. Well, let's just see who laughs last. Okay, that's enough. Marius, you're being extradited to New York. Now, they'll ask you these questions there, too. You're in pretty deep trouble as it is. You might think about cooperating. We're waiving the stolen car charge, you know. But you know why you're here. Where'd you dump the gun? What gun? What gun? That 32 you shot one on the back of the head with your punk. That gun. I don't know what you're talking about. Huh? Well, maybe I can help you remember. Okay, Harry, that's enough. Now, let's not blow it. Just give me five minutes with him, Ed. Wait outside if you can't watch. Forget it, Harry. I only have two questions for him. Will you tell us what happened to the gun? Do you want to confess to the murder of Theodore Warren? Okay. Take him back to his cell. I had to confide in someone. I took a chance on Leroy Grimes and told him I was up on a murder charge, but I thought I might be innocent. I didn't say why. Warren had been killed with a 32. It was a 38 I'd dropped in his room. There was no mention of a 38. And they said Warren was shot in the back of the head. It didn't make sense. The next day I had a visitor. The jailer took me to a conference room. A sheet of heavy plate glass partitioned the table where I sat. And across from me, through the glass, sat a tall, middle-aged man. His curling, dark hair was laced with gray. He was well-dressed. I'd never seen him before. The jailer stepped outside and stationed himself just out of earshot. I just sat and waited until... Mr. Marius, I'm Ethan Lloyd. I've been retained as your attorney. If you agree. I don't have any money. My fee has already been paid. Who paid you? I don't know. Perhaps you do. This morning, a messenger delivered this letter to my office. It's typed and unsigned. Dear Mr. Lloyd, herewith is a cashier's check for $3,500 to retain your services in behalf of James Marius, who is now held in Los Angeles County Jail. He's charged with the murder of Theodore Warren in New York City. I'm a friend of Mr. Marius, and have always admired a gambling man. Please show him this letter, as it may help him feel more at ease in accepting your services. Does this mean anything to you? I think so. I accept your offer to defend me. Well, I'll do what I can. Now, you must understand, however, that I won't actually represent you at your trial in New York. Why not? Well, I'm not a member of the New York State Bar. Your defense can be handled more ably by a qualified attorney familiar with the New York State Code. I know of several excellent men there, and I'll arrange for one of them to represent you. But we uh, might as well start thinking about your defense now. Tell me what happened. I told Lloyd what happened, or just about all of it. I didn't mention Lou, by name or even indirectly. I said nothing of the plans and the rest of it. When I'd finished, Lloyd said... There are uh, some big holes in your story, Mr. Marius. You're not telling me everything. I'm telling you the truth. So far as it goes. But you're not telling me all the facts. From your story, how could Warren have been shot in the back of the head? He was facing you. I don't know. And how come the cops are looking for a thirty-two? Didn't they find a thirty-eight? It was still in the room when I ran out. How much have you told the police? Nothing. Now, that's good. 
Anything you have to say, say only to me. Oh, I'm going to leave a copy of today's paper with the jailer. He'll give it to you. I'll be in touch with you every day. Back in my cell, I read the story about my arrest. There was also a short interview with Warren's widow. She'd never heard of me or couldn't identify me from a photograph. And that was about all, except it was speculated that Warren left an estate of an estimated $10 million. Grimes, my cellmate, was impressed that I had Ethan Lloyd for an attorney. He told me Lloyd was the best and the most expensive. He said I was sure to get off with 20 years and be eligible for parole in seven. My one consolation was that Lou hadn't abandoned me. She must have sold the painting to raise legal funds. 2,555 nights. Seven years of not seeing Lou. The prospect was intolerable. The pain unbearable. If that was the best, it wasn't good enough. There had to be another way. There just had to be. closely confined with each other, either become good friends or dire enemies. In the weeks I spent awaiting extradition to New York, I shared cigarettes, papers, magazines, extra food luxuries supplied by funds from Lloyd with Leroy Grimes. Grimes had spent most of his adulthood in crime, so he instructed me in the ways of jails, prisons, jailers, and wardens. I lost my suspicions of him, and we became good friends. Then one morning, I was brought a new suit of clothes and informed that two New York detectives were waiting to take me back. While I changed, Grimes watched me glumly. Uh, look, just remember, don't let them grind you down. If I'm not around, they won't be able to. You gonna try to bust out? Yeah, I thought about it. Haven't you? <laughs> Every con does. Look, don't get sore if I say so, but I didn't think of you that way. Why not? Well, you just ain't the type. Well, I ain't the type to be here either. Uh, I don't mean that you are, Leroy. Oh, but I am, Jim. I am. Well, I'd have to have the chance and a little luck, Leroy. Is my tie straight? Oh, yeah. Well, what's that? Where did you get that? Been keeping it at my mattress for the right occasion. <laughs> right sharp, ain't it? Well, what is it? A knitting needle? Well, you won't get in any sewing where you're headed. But it works pretty good on locks, though. I don't know how to pick locks. You know how to kill a man, don't you? Yes, I guess I do. Come here closer. See? Work it in the sleeve of your jacket, just above the cuff. Nobody will find it. Oh, hey, forgot something. This overcoat button, made out of bone about the size of a quarter. Here, take it. You know, what's this little hole drilled in it? Put the big end of the needle in it. Fits good. With the button on the end, you can jab the needle way in real hard. In a temple or back of an eye. It's better than a knife. Well, like you say, if you get the chance and a little luck. Thanks, Leroy. Uh, here, keep the rest of this carton of smokes. No, no, sir, Jim. You keep them. You're going to need them. Well, I guess this is it. Yeah, well, been right fine knowing you, Marius. I'll, uh, I'll read about you in the papers up in Quentin. Yeah, hope it's not in your bits. Goodbye, Leroy. And thanks. Good luck. I was turned over to the custody of the two New York detectives. One was a young guy, blonde, blue-eyed, tall, name of Hodges. The other was Blackie Schwartz, stocky, tough, middle-aged, with 20 years on the force. Schwartz wore a revolver in plain view and walked behind Hodges and me. My right wrist was cuffed to Hodges' left. They drove me to Lax, to Los Angeles International Airport, to await a flight back to New York. I knew if I were to escape, it would have to be before I got on the plane. Blackie had arranged with the airline for us to board before the other passengers. We had nearly an hour before flight time. 
Hey, Hodges, would you mind if we stopped at the washroom? You can wait till we get on the plane. Yeah, but they keep the washrooms locked while they're on the ground. What do you think, Blackie? Yeah, okay, we got plenty of time. I was thinking fast. I'd worked the needle from my sleeve during the ride in from jail to the airport. I had it in my left pocket with a button. The end of the needle was set in a small hole. I kept my left hand in my pocket, grasping it. And when we reached the washroom... It was a big room, all white tile. Luckily, we were alone. Blackie watched our every step. I was hoping Hodges embarrassed easily. Hey, I'm not going in there with you. Well, take the cuffs off. I don't like this. No, I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm not that stupid. You just leave the door open. As soon as Hodges unlocked the cuffs, I grabbed him and pulled him inside. The door swung shut to Blackie's face. I had Hodges in a headlock with my right arm. My left hand held a long needle at the corner of his eye. One little jab, Hodges. One little jab and this needle goes right into your brains. You want to be a hero? Don't shoot, Blackie! Drop the gun, Schwartz. I jabbed this needle a little way and your partner's blind for life. All the way, it's all over. I can wait here as long as you can, Barry. Yes, you can't hold him forever. Maybe not, but I've got nothing to lose. Drop the gun on the floor and kick it in here. Can you move, Hodges? Enough to... I don't know! You better do as I say, Blackie. Oh, you know what? Ah! Hodges, you all right? Get him the gun, Blackie, please! That's playing it smart, Blackie. Now open the door. Real slow. That's it. Now, you and Hodges, just put your arms around this post. While you try on these irons for size. I took the keys and left Schwartz and Hodges handcuffed to the post, gagged with shreds of Hodges' shirt. They wouldn't be following me for a while. I relieved Blackie of his expense money and I left. Outside the washroom in the busy terminal, I easily lost myself in the crowd. I got in a cab and told the driver to take me to the San Fernando Valley, North Hollywood. I got out and started walking. By this time, I was sure that Schwartz and Hodges had the alarm out for me. Not only the LAPD, but the county sheriffs and the highway patrol would be alerted. I needed somewhere to hide out and quickly ducked down a side street. I had no destination, just kept walking. And then in my aimless path, I spotted a for sale sign planted in the brown, overgrown yard of a small frame house with a shake roof and plastered salt and pepper stucco. It was exactly like a thousand others in the valley, only unmistakably vacant. I kept on walking, for the idea grew. Not far away, I came upon a supermarket. I bought a big bag of supplies with practically the last of the money I'd taken from Blackie. Canned foods, six-pack of beer, can opener, and two heavy, full-sized beach towels. I had a phone call to make, the number I'd gotten off the cart at Rothsman's just before I'd been picked up. There was a payphone at the gas station on the corner. Miss Lucille Jackson, Hello? Please. Uh, does Lucille Jackson live there? No, not Jackson. Who's this? Camilla de Maid. Well, is anyone else at home? Nobody see but me. Well, maybe I have the wrong number. Well, whose home is this? If you don't know how you call, I'm not tell you. Another dead end. Still no way to reach Lou. I had one more call I could make and had another dime ready when two highway patrol units rolled into the parking lot. As casually as I could, I took my bag of groceries and backtracked the exact route I'd taken before to the vacant house I'd seen. Dusk was falling and I could see no one who might see me, so I checked the doors and windows. It was locked up tight. What was a little breaking and entering after what I'd been through? I waited a few minutes to be sure no one had heard me and climbed in through the broken kitchen window. It reminded me of my plane crash dream, only in reverse. This time I had to get in, not out. I sat on the cold floor well below window level and opened a can of beans. 
I ate them cold from the can with my fingers and washed them down with a warm beer. Exhausted, I wrapped myself in the two beach towels and started to drift off. I tried to shut off my mind, but it was filled with Lou. I had to make that call in the morning. It was a long shot, but a chance. Perhaps my very last. I waited until noon the next day before leaving the house. At that hour, the neighborhood was empty and the supermarket crowded. I used the same payphone as before. This is Miss Hendon, business office. May I help you? Uh, yes. Uh, I think uh, there's an error in my bill. Uh, there's a charge of $7.70 for a long distance called a Denver. I don't know anyone there. Oh, what is your number? Uh, it's 761-4699. Just a moment, please. I don't see it listed on your account. For the third of last month? No. Huh, that's odd. It's right here. Well, could you have sent this bill to the wrong address? Uh, what street number do you have listed for me? 1355 Palomar Drive, North Hollywood. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, send us your remittance, less that charge, and I'll make a note of it. Well, will do. Thank you. Now I had the address. And one thread of hope. Whoever did live there could offer a clue to Lou's whereabouts. I left the supermarket and walked to a nearby movie theater. I sat through the feature twice, waiting for the night to come. Behind the theater was a parking lot with wooden racks with seven bicycles. I smashed a cheap padlock on one and rode off. I figured the North Hollywood address to be about three miles away. I couldn't risk a taxi. I pedaled along, keeping away from the main, well-lighted, heavily-traveled streets. At an intersection, a black-and-white patrol car pulled up alongside me. And the cop driving gave me a curious look. Saving gas? <laughs> my, my wife says I'm getting fat. Well, you're going to be stiff tomorrow. <laughs> I already am. Hey, you should get a reflector so you don't get run down. I watched him pull away and turn the corner. Luckily, Palomar Drive was nearby. I left the bike behind some camellia bushes. The house was a small Mediterranean-style villa set back in a lawn dominated by green trees. I walked up the shrub-lined drive which curved in a sweep to the door. From the drawn shades, I saw the soft illumination of lights. At the door, I adjusted my jacket and then rang the bell. your eyes and listen here to this week's continuing study in suspense fourth of forever i'm rod serling and this is the zero hour you've been listening to the hollywood radio theater's presentation of the zero hour heard every weekday at this time Rod Serling is your host. Fourth of Forever was written by Bill S. Ballinger. John Daner is Marius, and Susan Oliver is Lou. Featured in the cast are Lou Krugman, Byron Kane, Brett Morrison, Jay Novello, Sam Edwards, Jerry Fogel, and Virginia Gregg. Zero Hour is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Jack Myers is executive producer, Rochelle Sherman, associate producer, and Kim Weisskopf, story editor. Music conducted and composed by Stanley D. Hoffman. The Hollywood Radio Theater theme was played by Ferranti and Teicher and is now available on United Artists Records and Tapes. This has been a J.M. Colas Enterprises production. Hugh Douglas speaking.
Tune in tomorrow and once again. Rest your eyes and listen here to the Zero Hour. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. The Hollywood Radio Theater. Every day at this time, Monday through Friday, a J.M. Colas Enterprises production, The Hollywood Radio Theater presents an unusual tale of mystery and suspense. Every week, Monday through Friday, the Hollywood Radio Theater presents... I'm Rod Serling. You're listening to The Zero Hour. Rest your eyes. Open your mind. Exercise your imagination. This week, Bill S. Ballinger's study of a deadly obsession. Fourth of Forever. Starring John Daner. And Susan Oliver. In Elliot Lewis's production of... The Zero Hour. James Marius and Lou Jackson have a date with destiny. But first they have some matters to settle. Marius is a wanted man. The police know his general whereabouts. Warren was shot in the back of the head. And the matter of a second gun. This date with destiny was assured before they'd ever met. James Marius and Lou Jackson. Star-crossed from the beginning. Two people slated to make both sides of a single decision. Hinging on a third party. Fourth of Forever concludes right after this word. Lou. Darling. Don't, don't stand out there in the light. Come in. Lou. I, I just can't believe it's you. Is it? You look different. Your, your, your hair. Do, do you like it? Oh, sure. I liked how it was. Oh, I had to hide somehow. You, you understand. I guess it is a rather silly disguise. Oh, don't worry. I'll get used to it. Poor baby. Someday I'll change it back for you. The Gazetti. You didn't sell it? No, it's my most prized possession. Uh, but the, the, the money you sent to Lloyd, the attorney. I, I sent the money, but I didn't sell the painting. 
Well, but then how did... Oh, long story, darling. I'll explain later. Ah, let's have a drink to celebrate our reunion. Oh, no, 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 I've stopped. Or nearly. Have a brandy, anyway. Come, sit by me. Well, this house, who does it belong to, Lou? Oh, friends of mine. I, I stayed with them, oh, months ago. When I ran away from the apartment, I came here. And they're out of town for a short time. Why'd you leave your apartment? I, I couldn't find you. I had to after... All that happened. But I called you long distance from New York and you wouldn't, you wouldn't talk. I know. I was a terrible coward, but I was... I panicked. Oh, come on. You knew I wouldn't involve you. I hadn't said a word about you. Not to the lawyer or the cops or anyone. Uh, you don't understand, darling. I need this drink. Look at me. I was in Warren's hotel room when you killed him. You what? Surprised. Uh, not really. From what the papers said or didn't say, and in jail, but, uh... Well, tell me what happened. All right, darling. After you left the airport for New York, I felt, well... I felt I'd, I'd talked you into it. You didn't really want to rob Warren. I'd made you take all the risks. I felt it was my place to be with you, so I caught the next flight to New York. But you didn't know where I'd be staying. No, I just thought, well, I'd, I'd find you eventually at the Park Hamilton. I went up to Warren's suite about 11 sometime, a little after, but you were already inside. The side door, the one to the bedroom, was open, so I went in and... That's when I heard shots in the living room. As I dropped my gun. Yes, and, uh, uh, you did. But I picked it up and took it away so the police wouldn't find it. Well, they didn't need to. My bloody prints were all over the place. And as long as Warren was dead, I opened his briefcase and took what was in it. $65,000 in cash and about 40000 in negotiable securities. What? We were in up to our necks already, and we needed that money to get away. I used some of it to hire Ethan Lloyd. Yeah, uh, well, anyway, you, you took it. Huh? Yes. Warren was dead. I didn't know you'd been hit, so I went to the airport to wait, but you didn't show up. I caught the next flight home, and in the morning I'd, I read that you'd been wounded. Poor baby. What happened to the gun? Right now, it's somewhere at the bottom of the East River. Is there anyone else here? Not right now. Can I stay here a few days until we can get oh, away? Oh, no, it would be too dangerous. The maid will be here in the morning, and people could drop in unexpectedly. But I did stay the night. At dawn, well before the maid came to work, Lou made breakfast. It was like old times, nearly, as she smiled at me across the table... But the mood was broken when we began discussing a plan of escape. Once you're in Mexico, it'll be easy to get somewhere else far away. And wherever it is, I'll meet you there. Lou, I can't make it without you. Come with me to Mexico City. Oh, I want to, darling. I want to very badly. But the securities, they're so difficult to exchange abroad. Don't forget, we'll have to live in South America or, or Europe. Marius... You have to get away today, darling. It's the only way. I'll meet you later. More coffee? Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, I'll need a passport. I can get a phony one in Mexico, but it'll cost. Mm. How much? When I was flying there, I think the going price was a couple of grand. Oh, aren't you glad I have the money now? Uh, that's a lot of cash to carry around. Well, you're right. I'll need a gun. I had one, but left it in the house where I've been hiding out. Too risky going back there now. Uh, what'll I do? Uh, oh, there's one around the house here. They keep it for prowlers. I'll get it for you. Lou came back to the kitchen and took the gun from her purse. She laid it in my hand. But I wasn't watching. I couldn't help but see, when she opened the purse, several neat packets of hundred-dollar bills... The gun fits snugly in my palm. It was a small, snub-nosed 32. It was barely light 
outside as we prepared to leave. I stopped by the back patio to admire the garden, potted plants hanging and standing, the flower bed alive with daisies and petunias in full bloom. Lou tooted the horn lightly for me. I got in and we drove off. By the time we reached San Diego, the sun was high. Crossing the border, we must have looked like any two American tourists. We drove right through and on into Tijuana. Well, when will I see you again? Thursday. I'll be down. Well, why so long? <laughs> You'll be busy, and so will I. Well, that's four days from now. Seems like forever. How much money will you need? How much have you got? Yeah, enough. Well, I'll need enough for the passport, the hotel, the travel arrangements... Not to mention payoffs and whatnot. Darling, just tell me, how much do you want? You better give me ten grand, just to be safe. Ah, uh, ten thousand dollars? <laughs> Who are you planning on bribing the whole country? If all goes well, I'll be in Mexico City tomorrow night, Hotel Del Prado. Meet me there on Thursday. I'll be there. It took me a day longer than I'd expected. The travel arrangements were easy, and getting the passport, however, took some doing. I located a few people I had known in the past who in turn contacted other operators and so on. I got the passport Tuesday morning, the stolen one, doctored with my picture and new stamps. It was good enough that I wouldn't have any trouble. That afternoon, I flew into Mexico City and registered at Hotel Del Prado under my new name, Harold J. Hanna. I spent the next day making final arrangements, checking schedules, buying clothes. Everything I needed, I could get in the shops contained within the building, so I never left the hotel. Finally, Thursday night arrived. And with it, Lou. Darling. Oh, it's so good to see you. Yeah, what's in the bag? Two bottles. Ah, <laughs> one champagne, one brandy. Just like we began. Oh, you're wonderful, Lou. You really are. <sighs> Did you get the passport? Yeah, no problem. You are now in the arms of Harold J. Hanna. Oh, I liked Marius better. Well, maybe we'll change it back when we get to Greece. Greece? It's perfect for us. You won't believe all I've got planned. Come on up to the room, Mrs. Hannah. I'll tell you all about it. It was a while before we talked. We didn't even get the bottle open. I was looking at the moon full in the night sky when she came back into the room wearing the pink nightgown she'd worn all afternoon. Uh, tell me about Greece, Marius. You don't sound thrilled. Lou? Yes, darling, I'm listening. Yeah, well, it isn't Greece exactly. It's a tiny island off the coast in the Aegean Sea. Mixos. Mm, sounds smugly. And I'm planning on us buying property there, settling down. I've already put in a bid on our old hotel. We could fix it up darling, and work the tourist trade and have beautiful children. Uh, Marius. Now, there's an Air France flight from here to Paris. We connect from Paris to Rome and then on to Athens. I made reservations for two on the plane, leaving tomorrow. One for Mr. Harold J. Hanna and one for Miss Lucille Jackson. But you have your passport? Yes, in my suitcase. Well, where is your suitcase? Oh, we must have left it in the lobby. It's in Los Angeles. I've been trying to tell you, Marius. But why? Darling, you must know. I love you. Well, then come with me tomorrow. I haven't cashed in the securities yet. These things take time. Lou? What are you thinking? Oh, I was thinking of the night. It's quiet and peaceful. It goes on forever, because every moment somewhere in this world, it is night. Do you know why the night is peaceful? Because it has no conscience. It neither wants, nor remembers, nor condemns. At night, people are born, they make love, they die. Makes no difference. Night merely exists, always. I'm sorry, my darling, for the way things worked out. I'm sorry it was you. Will you come? Yes. Yes, I'll come. When? Two months. All right. You'll fly to Athens, then sail from Piraeus to Mixos on the Persian Queen. I will... Wait, wait. No, I'm fixing the date. The ship sails on the first and third Monday of every month. So with a two-day layover in Athens and two days on board, you should be in Mixos 
June 4th. Hmm. That's two months from today. Two months is a long time. Uh, no, my darling. Forever is a long time. I'll be waiting for you. The Persian queen stood offshore in the small port of Nixos. I stood on the deck, leaned over the railing, looking at my new home. I went ashore in a converted lighter. At the foot of the ancient stone pier was a taverna, an open-air establishment featuring a great gnarled olive tree growing right up through the rock. I stood there, holding my suitcases, until... Would you care to join us? Oh. Yes, yes, I would. Thank you. We saw you arrive. You know, there's so little to do here that we all hurry to make friends with a stranger. I am Ivan Lamarck, and this is Father Gilbert. Miss Lamarck? Ivan. Father? I'm Harold J. Hanna. J for James. Are you a tourist, Mr. Hanna? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm entirely at large. Hmm. Uh, is there a hotel here? Only one. It is not large, not small, not good, not bad. It is also not cheap, but one has no choice. It is called the Acropole. The Acropole was run by Constantine Gregoras, a heavyset, nearsighted man. He assigned me a tiny, stark room, which he claimed was the best in the house. The first few days were torture. I was a man alone in a strange country. The last day and night with Lou burned deep in my memory. I could have easily afforded scotch, but thought it best to let the seven grand I had left cool. Time passed slowly. There was nothing to do on Mixos but sit in the taverna, drink ouzo, and talk. I got to know and like Ivan and the padre, as I called him. Together we made quite a trio. Ivan, a thin, dark girl with a pixie face and boyish cut hair, was a musician. She had studied in Paris, which was her home, as well as in New York. And so now I am in Mixos because it does not take so much money. Is there a music school here? No, there is nothing here. But I practice to compose music, which is not bad. Uh, Padre, uh, what's a Roman Catholic like you doing on a Greek Orthodox island like this? Do I have a calling, Harold? Uh, including Miss Lamath, there are um, eight members in my parish. Are you British? Yes, my home is... Uh, uh, was England. I I miss it. When are you going home? Oh, soon, perhaps. Uh, but then I may be here forever. Forever is a long time. Uzo. Uh, thanks. Hello, Yvonne. Join me? Yes. How? Newspapers. Why did you get them? The Persian queen brought them yesterday. I had them sent uh, from Athens. From Los Angeles? Yes. It's my home. Well, near it, anyway. You wait all day for the Persian queen just for newspaper? <laughs> I suppose I do. This time, anyway. Next time, I'm hoping they'll be delivered by someone. Oh, you're waiting for somebody. A woman. Is she beautiful? Yes, Ivan. I am waiting for a beautiful woman. I have been for some time. And will you have Father Gilbert marry you and this woman? Only if you promise to be maid of honor. <laughs> we will see. I cannot promise. The L.A. papers had dropped the Warren story. There was no mention of the search for James Marius either. Though I began to feel safe, those last two weeks of waiting were the longest of my life. Each day an eternity. Waiting, waiting. Until... I was on the pier at dusk when they lowered the lighter over the side of the Persian Queen. I watched it all the way into shore, watched and waited. I could see the purser, but no one else. Uh, did an American woman get on at Piraeus? No. And no one getting off at Mixos? No one. Here are your papers. I stopped off at the taverna but didn't stay One crisp hundred dollar bill paid for drinks all around I retreated to the Acropole with my newspapers and a bottle of scotch In my room I threw myself on the bed and broke the cords on the papers 
And there was the answer. Page one. Society news. Former Mrs. Theodore Warren weds prominent attorney. I stared at a thousand-word picture of Ethan Lloyd and... and the woman I had known as Lucille Jackson. I didn't bother to read the article. I already knew the times and places. I guess I have known all along. I was just dumb enough to fall into it. Hmm. Lou, or whatever her real name was, Mrs. something or other, Warren Lloyd, was a woman of money, physician, and separated from her millionaire husband. And she had a plan to hire a private detective, Rothman, to find a man of weak will and strong desire, James Marius. She needed such a man to speed up the proceedings. Divorce takes such a long, long time, especially with a wealthy attorney waiting in the wings. So, make up a Clara, create a temporary Lou Jackson, and it's goodbye, Warren. Hello, ten million bucks. Phase out James Marius. That's about it. The way things are. And she's sorry. Well, it could be worse. I could be in prison. I could be dead. I could be a murderer. But I'm not. That flash in the mirror back in Warren's hotel room tells me so. I could be broke. But I'm not. I have lots of money. Not ten million, but enough for James Marius. Marius. She likes that name better than Hannah. Well, so do I. I think I'll change it back. I like the way it looks on a passport... I'm getting bored here in Mixos anyway, with all this money and nothing to do. Well, I gave her a chance. Too bad she missed the boat. Mm. Too bad about the letter I have to send now to the Los Angeles police, suggesting they go to 1355 Palomar Drive and test fire the 32 caliber revolver they'll find under the Meyer lemon tree. And a wooden planter. I think they'll find it's the missing weapon in the unsolved murder of Theodore Warren. Too bad it's registered to Mrs. Theodore Warren Lloyd. Like the lady says, Marius, you can't lose. The funny thing about murder, you just can't get away with it. That concludes this week's production of The Zero Hour, Bill S. Ballinger's Fourth of Forever. Next week, we'll begin another exciting dramatization of a tale of mystery and suspense. We'll tell our story in five days, at the same time, Monday through Friday. So, on Monday, rest your eyes and listen here to The Zero Hour. Theater's presentation of The Zero Hour, heard every weekday at this time. Rod Serling is your host. Fourth of Forever was written by Bill S. Ballinger. John Daner was Marius, and Susan Oliver was Luke. Featured in the cast were Ben Wright and Lillian Byer. Zero Hour is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Jack Myers is executive producer, Rochelle Sherman, associate producer, and Kim Weisskopf, story editor. Music conducted and composed by Stanley D. Hoffman. The Hollywood Radio Theater theme was played by Ferrante and Teicher and is now available on United Artists Records and Tapes. This has been a J.M. Colas Enterprises production. Hugh Douglas speaking. Tune in Monday and once again... Rest your eyes and listen here to The Zero Hour.
Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise, you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio.